Well, today's, I'm going to get this clear, but today's uh, speaker today, we have Dr. Patty Amston from Patty Amston Ministry. She is with us. She is an amazing teacher, preacher, many things that you can share more. Sister Patty, uh, we're blessed to have you. And so you come on up and uh, you just give the word that God's given you for us today. Amen. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you all? Blessed. We want to really be outside, don't we? In this warm weather, what an amazing goodness. I walked out to the car and I went, whoa, come on, heat. Just... Now, you know, about July, I'll be saying, go away, heat. Yeah. Not yeah. right now. Thank you. This is great. It's got a drop or something. Thank you. Um, Pastor Dennis is. Um, it just he was feeling a little bit of a stomach ache yesterday and he woke up with it again this morning and so we just decided it might be better for you all if he didn't come with me i don't think he's contagious but nonetheless it's just a good season right now to be cautious of everything right so yeah so we send blessings to him <coughs> blessings to uh your pastor to brian where where is the feed going right there right there <laughs> love you love you Brian um, you're gonna want to hear this and you're all gonna want to hear this I was in uh, Washington DC uh, December 31st till January 7th and we were holding this prayer uh, vigil there before that was before the break-in in the riot remember that happened on the 6th all right so we we're up there praying and J uh, James Nesbitt had conduct had called the uh, gathering and every night he would say I've got a friend in Springfield Pastor Brian that we want to pray for so oh, wow. every day in in spring uh, not in Springfield but in Washington DC from this capital to that capital there was prayers going out for you so we, we bless you and love you and believe God's going to strengthen you heal you bring life so um, uh, tenaciously into your body is going to drive out every infection and everything that would war against you I was just thinking of all the time that we have known you all there have been several infections uh, that act like chains around your pastor and I said, you know what, that this is the testimony of this church to be broken chains. And so this morning, this and I enforce that and reinforce that over his body and, and over this assembly. And I know that when he was a young man, right. first starting out in the ministry, just so many visions alive in his heart back then and so much energy to do it. And so the other thing we claim for you, Brian, is that those visions will uh, come about and those dreams will be able to be accomplished and you're going to have strength in your body to Amen. be able to do it. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so I had um, a couple of meetings in the Chicago area last weekend, and we had a little bit of business kind of stuff we had to do in Springfield, so we were on our way last weekend back home, which is Collinsville, and this is en route, and um, so we called to see if you all uh, would be gracious enough to open the pulpit this morning because I just love to be blessed by you and then Dennis and I wanted to come and do whatever we could to deposit a blessing so that's why I'm here and it's not always uh, that I'm on this route you know although more nowadays than I have been so because uh, we're doing a lot of work in the state of Illinois so I'm great I'm grateful that you open your hearts pastor I'm grateful you open the uh, pulpit I am grateful God bless you and those precious babies of yours. Love their, they're like our, it's not that we don't have enough grandbabies, we have 17, but we have four more. Now. Speaking of a grandbaby, you wanna hear a good testimony? Of course. Our daughter that lives in Florida uh, has uh, five children. She had our oldest, she was our oldest granddaughter. Then she, she had a set of twins. And then the doctors were suggesting that multiples were probably their future. And her body was um, a little bit, um, it, it was dangerous for her to have mul more multiples. So they started looking in the realm of adoption. And they adopted two grand grandbabies from Guatemala. Aww. So they have a, a Dennis and they have a, Be a Becca. And the first, uh, the first uh, grandbaby from Guatemala, his name is Dennis, and he is 100% Mayan. So like you would say Cherokee Indian here, Mayan Indian, he's 100% native Mayan in Guatemala. And um, his mother, we did know 
her name, that's about all we knew about her, but through the adoption procedures, we had a little bit of information about her. So we, uh, my daughter, her heart picked up when she found out there was a baby there named Dennis because her grandpa, or grandpa, my, my husband Dennis, so Dawn's dad, Dennis, I got to confuse with names here, uh, he's adopted. And our old, our children kind of went through the journey with uh, with my husband as to the, some of the pain of that adoption, some of the rejection, and you know stuff that just it just kind of goes with the things that God can marvelously heal you from. And so anyway, um, my husband found his mother, and that was an amazing time of restoration uh, when Dennis was 42. So now my daughter's in Guatemala. The first referral she gets is a baby named Dennis. So, we, I mean, our ears picked up because that's a rare name for a Mayan to, you know, that's not a name that he would be carrying, but that was the name his birth mom gave her. So we were able to bring Dennis home when he was one year old, just right after his first birthday, and he, he's been an amazing young man. But he's had this longing for finding a mom, his, his birth mom. And almost every year on his birthday, he would hit this place of sorrow. You know, and God always gave us wisdom and words and love, and so it's, it's all been fine, but there was a longing. So now he's 14 and heading into high school, and my daughter was just feeling like maybe moving into this next phase of manhood, um, you know, that awkward teenage years, the stuff that can happen with kids. She was just saying to him, Dennis, would you like us to begin to search for your mom? And he wanted that. Mm -hmm. So the long story made short is this morning, right before I came here, Dennis was on the phone, Facebook, face, face to face, face, FaceTime, FaceTime thank you, <laughs> with his mom uh, oh, in Guatemala. Oh. And he got to meet his three sisters, which interestingly enough, when Don, when my Dennis met his mama, he met his three sisters. Oh, this Dennis oh, wow. met, I know, met his, <laughs> his mom and his three sisters. So today has been just a yes. just a wonderful day, yeah, and he's doing well. He's we didn't know, you know, if it would throw him, yeah. uh, but we do remember when my Dennis met his mom, my mother-in-law, that that was a wonderful time of healing. So I don't know, you know, uh, she is willing as time goes by, maybe for Dennis to go and actually get to know her better. And when we brought him home, we felt like he would be a man whose feet would be on two nations. So who knows what's ahead, but that's been a joyful testimony in, in our life. All right, well, um, I, I felt like I wanted to just talk to you uh, rather to, rather than just like me preaching at you, although I'm not, I'm not guaranteed I won't slide into that because it's an easy slide when you're a preacher, but uh, I thought maybe I'd like to just talk to you about maturation, maturing in God. And um, I wanted to just read a couple of scriptures, but I want to uh, just tell you a little story uh, from an, about another grandbaby before before I read the Bible. Um, so I just say in Jesus' name, our ears are open, our hearts are open. The Spirit of the Living God, you are our teacher, and you're the one who uh, causes the Word of God to drop in our hearts. You're the one of God that you're the one that causes the Word to be quickened to us. So I just lose uh, your ministry among us, Holy Spirit. And Father, I thank you that we are yours, we belong to you, and uh, your love is shed abroad in our hearts in Christ Jesus. Amen. 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 All right, so um, I have um, five children, and then from those five children we have uh, six, well, 13 natural born, I mean mom, moms and dads are children and their spouses, three that are international adoptions. I told you about the two from Guatemala, we have another young grandson from Ethiopia. And then we have one foster who's been with us enough years that we call her our granddaughter too. And uh, so that gives us 17. So there's a lot. Uh, when, when it's Christmas time, I sometimes think I want to leave home. <laughs> but um, my son and daughter-in-law, uh, my daughter-in-law was going to have her 40th birthday and they wanted to do some fun stuff. So they asked if I would watch their uh, three boys. They have three boys. And so uh, they're all AJs. They're, all their names are Alexander Joseph. Uh, I shouldn't have started this. Alexander Joseph, <laughs> Artie, but Arthur James and Errol, uh, Errol, 
<laughs> Jay. Dude, he's not watching me, sorry, sorry, Errol. But anyway, all three boys, all three AJs were at our house for a couple of days. So they'd been playing outside, and I have a, one of those tubs that has the jets in them, you know, so you can hit the button and the bubbles come. And they love to put the bubble bath in and let the bubble oh, bath come like that after here on them. So the bubble bath was going, and they're in the tub. And we could see that the, it was getting dark outside the skies and everything, and a storm was coming, so Dennis put the TV on. And sure enough, there were potential tornadoes warnings oh coming through our area. Then the sirens went off. So now I go into the bathroom and say to the babies, you know what, let's just get, let's just get out of the bubbles. We're trying to be just calm. Get out of the bubbles. And um, they didn't, weren't ready. They hadn't, hadn't bubbled themselves out yet. But uh, So I did have to say, well, you'll, when you come out, you'll hear their sirens go on. And so the weather's kind of getting stormy out. And we just don't want you in the water. Let's just be in case we need to go to the basement or something. So... Uh, so AJ, uh, well, like, they're all AJ, so I can't do that, but with this one we actually call that, uh, little Artie, Arthur, he, um, he, he panicked. I got him out and got his jammies on him, and he was just scared. And so no matter what I said to him, uh, uh, he just got, he, he was just panicked and um, very, a lot of anxiety. And so I threw my arms around him, you know, I said, oh, buddy, God's here with us and we're all here. We've got a big basement, we, we, we're fine, everything's fine, Jesus is gonna take care of us, but I couldn't seem to. And so I kind of turned him around and looked at him one time and I said, I said, Arthur, look at Nana. And I said, honey, what you practice is what you get good at. And when I said it, I went, there is so much wisdom in that, uh -huh. not just for him. Because I said, you're practicing being afraid. And I said, you can choose to practice something else. And so we're going to do that right now. We're going to practice trusting Jesus. Come on, practice this with me. And so I can, so that kind of became our thing for the weekend. What you practice, you become good at. And I just want to, if you go home with nothing else from today, I want that to stick in your brain. Because we are often unaware of what we practice. We are often unaware of what we rehearse. Sometimes we're not even aware of what goes on in our mind. It's like we're so list, used to listening to our own thoughts, we don't even listen to the thoughts we're saying to ourselves. And they just become our normal thoughts, but we're practicing in our brain. Instead of going, wait, wait, what did I just tell myself? What kind of fear did I just talk to myself? What kind of anxiety? What kind of poverty? What kind of... Uh, uh, I'm, I'm ostracized from society. I'm disenfranchised from family. You know, what, how many of you know? We everybody's got stuff. Yeah, yeah I just told you uh, my my. I've been on this journey with my husband for. Um, he's 75, and he was 42 when he found his mom. But that wasn't the end of his journey. It was just one more step in his journey of being healed. Mm -hmm. So there's, but there, in our early days, he talked rejection all the time. And uh, as God began to heal him, he was be able to put those words out of his mouth. We talk like Artie was practicing fear. He was practicing anxiety. And remember, what you practice is what you become good at. Mm -hmm. So uh, practicing is actually the, a pathway to maturation. Uh, we we are born in the natural to grow up. How's that for the deepest theology you ever will get? But you know we don't we don't pick up our babies and say to them, "Oh, you're going to stay little and two months old forever." Oh, yeah. In fact, sometimes you can't wait for some of the stages to move on past, right? Um, but we look at them and we say things to them like, "I wonder what you're going to be when you grow up." I wonder who is in there. I wonder what your personality is going to be. I wonder what your strengths are going to be. We know that wired into this little package is a personality type. It's a DNA coding. It's all this stuff that God has put within that baby. And we know that they will go through a maturation process. And the goal is a functioning adult. Isn't that right? I mean, so if you're if, as a parent, if you get your children to the place where they're age-wise grown up, but maturation level is not there, that's sad. Yeah. You, you watch people make decisions that they ought not to be making. Let me say, instead of putting that out there, we've all done this, mm -hmm. make decisions that really for our level of maturation, we should probably know better. Anybody like, like me, you look back and say, oh, if only I had known then what I know now, right? So everybody's made decisions that were not good. 
So, uh, but the goal is to raise up your children and get them mature to where when they walk into their adult life, they're mature and they're ready and they're wise and they're trained and they're capable. How many of you think there's no mystery in this? That, that's, all right. Now, if you take what I just said and move that over to the spirit realm, do you know that you are born again? So being, when you get born again, and I trust everybody in here is, if you're not, we'll take care of that this day. But uh, when you get born again, it's you get a brand new seed planted inside of you. Think in terms of going out to the dirt and planting a, an oak tree seed, a little oak seed in the ground. And you'd watch that seed that carries a DNA suck up the dirt Right, and transform that dirt out there into something other that wasn't there until the seed got planted. When you get born again, a seed is planted. Like when a woman gets pregnant, a seed is planted. Then in the womb, the seed or the coating becomes a baby, right? So you get born again, and the seed of Christ, if the seed of Christ, Christ in you, if that seed is planted in you, what in, let me say it this way, in the dirt of us, this seed is planting, what are we supposed to grow up to be? If Christ in us is, we're supposed to be a reflection of Christ, aren't we? We're supposed to be, we're supposed to grow up to be Christ-like. <coughs> we're supposed to be part of that. And that is God's purpose. You're born, again, to grow up, to mature, to become, here I say this, Christ on the earth. Of course, he's, he is the Christ, you know, but then because he's, they are, it's kind of like he's the mother plant, and then all the seed from that mother plant gets put in us, so there can be more plantings like in unto him. So you're in this process of maturation, uh, and what, as a child matures, what they practice develops them into that maturation process. So we're going to talk some more about that. That's We have to know how to practice the things of God in order to become all that God has wanted us to be. So let's start, uh, I, got, I just put down a number of scriptures, but let's begin in uh, Romans chapter 8. I'll just pull a couple of scriptures out of Romans 8. Um, I'm reading, if you have your Bibles and want to read along, otherwise I think you can follow me just by listening. But I'm going to begin reading in verse 28. And so these are some passages that we like to pull parts out of and use them. This, the first part I read, you're going to know everybody uses this one. This is a very convenient scripture to use. Whether we use it right or not, I don't know. But it says, we know all things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. So how many of you have ever used that passage when you're in a hard time believing that things are working together for good? All right. But in that, so apart from what you know about that first part of the verse, look at the last part of the verse. It says that we're called according to his purpose. So how many of you know God has a purpose? Mm -hmm. And we, want, we always need to know what that is. Yep. And then it goes on to say, for whom he did for no, he did predestine. Now, don't get freaked over this. This just means God has a purpose, and he's thought about that pur purpose ahead of time. He had a plan that fit his purpose. That's all that means. So that we do that. We decide what we're going to do, and then we think about that plan and how to bring it about. And then we predestine our steps to accomplish our plan. So don't worry, don't think, don't overthink that at this point. Just listen to what I've said. God had a purpose, and he made the plans to be able to accomplish that purpose. And then it tells us what he's planned to do. And this is the part I want you to look at. To be conformed to the image of the Son. If he knew you, this was his plan for you, to be conformed to the image of the Son. That's what I just said. Put the seed in, and the seed grows, and it becomes like the mother plant. So Christ is the seed, and it, it actually even says that because Jesus is the firstborn of many brethren. So we are part of the family. If you're part of a family, mm -hmm. you get the seed line of that family put in you, and so you carry the name of that family. So you're born to do what? To grow up, mm -hmm. see? And God planned on having many grown-up sons, so he starts the process by getting us born into the family. And you mature by what you practice. I'm going to keep coming back to that. All right. So then it goes, um, 
So it says that Jesus might be the firstborn among many brethren, and then it tells us that we go through this process of being called and saved until we can get to the end of it, which is glorification. So I just want to say it again. I want to just read 28 and 29, just so you're on the same page with me. Um, oh, he's the teacher too, so <laughs> just stay with me here. All right. For we know that God works all of the circumstances in our life together for the end that he's got us going. Yeah, not just so we're happier, but for the end conclusion. Well, what is the end conclusion? Because he, we've been called according to something he's pre-thought about. He's got a purpose. And those that he knew and he called, he has a predestined plan. He has a pathway to get us to this purpose. And what is that purpose? To be conformed to the image of the Son. So Jesus is the firstborn of many sons. So, you know, kind of pat yourself around and go, I'm a son. I've been born into the family. I carry the DNA of Jesus. The goal is that I grow up. I mean, that, that's, that's the goal. Um, we sometimes in the church... Um, mercy and love and compassion, probably not the God definition of love, but natural love and mercy, tends us to want to um, coddle, which in sometimes uh, keeps maturation from coming. We have to we have to grow up, and so there are times that I'll say to kids. No, I'm not going to do that for you. You're old enough. Go do that for yourself. And there's something about doing something for yourself that causes you to realize I'm capable. If somebody else is doing it for you all the time, then the question is, if I set my hand to do it, could I do it? And so we can question ourselves whether we're capable. But when, when the children do what they've been assigned to do, they come back. What do they come back doing? Oh, my gosh. Remember, do you remember Jesus' disciples? They, he sent them out, and they came back. Even the demons are subject to our name. Oh, my gosh. We're all that and so much more. Right. Right? There's a sense of knowing who you are when you're uh, empowered to uh, do. And I'll tell you one thing God loves to do. He loves to give his power away. He loves to give us assignments and help us on those assignments so that we can become aware of what he already knows to be true about us. Mm -hmm. He knows who we are and what we're capable of doing. He's got more confidence in the Christ in us than we have in the Christ in us. Mm -hmm. He knows what, uh, what he's predestined us to be. Yeah. So he gives us his power and helps us to do things. Um, another passage I just pulled up here. I'm going to have to stop spending so much time on all the passages or am I going to get everything I think I want to say done? But we'll get some stuff done. It'll be good. All right. Philippians chapter 3 is a passage uh, where, you know what, before we do that one, let's do it one in Ephesians. Let's do Ephesians chapter 1 verse uh, 5. I'll save the Philippians for a moment later. Hmm. Ephesians 1 says, having predestined us, wait a minute, didn't we just hear that word? <laughs> and what is predestined? It said he's got a plan. Oh, yeah. And a he's got a purpose, and then the plan to get us to that destined end. All right, so having predestined us for what? Here he says it, unto the adoption of children by Christ Jesus, according to the good pleasure of his own will. Predestined us unto adoption means, adoption means having us function like full-grown adults. Ad adoption is, uh, in part, the word uh, in the Greek that would be our word for adult. So you know how there's ages, like you say, this is a, 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 a baby, this one is a toddler, this one is a teenager, you know, and we have different terms for stages of growth. The Greek has that too for different stages. And this word is equivalent to our word adult. So he's predestined, he has a purpose to set us in as full grown sons. That's, that's, that's the purpose. What's God's plan? He to birth you so you'll grow up. <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> You've been born to grow up. And um, so I was just thinking how, in a lot of ways, um, I, I think that this earth, that the days that we spend on the earth, is sort of like our womb for eternity. 
just like the seed goes into the mother's womb for a window of time until the baby is produced, we are becoming all that God wants us to be and that we will be for eternity. So God is kind of using earth and the circumstances for our maturation process so that we carry not only his image, but we also carry his glory. Because the Bible says when uh, Jesus came to the earth that we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, <clears throat> full of grace and truth. And we are called to have measures. Glory means, me, let me demysticize that word a little bit or despiritualize. Glory is release potential. That's what it is. So when something is in seed form, as it begins to develop and become what the seed is programmed into it, that's a form of a, a release potential. And that's when we go, oh my gosh, look at the beauty, look at the honor, look at the, uh, we praise the things that have release potential. Um, consider you're watching an athlete playing basketball, let's say. Uh, who's, who's that? LeBron. Let's say, let's say we're watching LeBron and he's on the court. And people watch his release potential because that's what we're seeing when we watch him. He's no longer in potential farm. He's in fully developed farm. So we watch him and people do what? They go, yay, praise LeBron. They, in, in a non- a bad way. They worship. They worth him. So we look at God and all the potential that is worth him and it invokes uh, all the potential released in him and it invokes praise from us. Amen. Oh my gosh, look what God can do. Mm -hmm. so, so praise and applause and uh, uh, acceptance, those words in your Hebrew and Greek are translations for the same word that is translated glory. Glory is the adoration given back to the person who has released potential. Can, did, did, did I lose you in that track? Tra tra so when, when uh, the kids do something good, you go, yay, and you clap for them, and you praise them because a level of potential has been released. Christ in us is the hope of Lord. what? It's the hope of it's our hope to go from glory, release potential, to glory, to release potential, to glory, to release potential. We are supposed to grow up so all that we are ordained to be will be made manifest. And so we go from release potential to release potential, or we go from glory to glory to glory until when you step on over into the other realm, do you know what that's called? That's called glorification. That, that's the term applied. We just actually just go back to um, the passage there in Romans. I skipped that, so maybe I ought not to. Back to the passage in Romans that we read about being a predestined to be a son, right? So in verse 30 it says, Moreover, those whom he knew ahead of time and called and set them on this pathway, he called them, he justified them. Justify means you're in right standing with God. But look at this. Then he also glorified. You're, you're, bo you're born to grow up, to become all you were meant to be. And so on, in this life, we go through this process of glorification from one <coughs> level to another level to another level. Then when you pass over to the other realm, whatever level of development or release potential or glory you carry, that's your glory in eternity. So <laughs> this, is, um, this is not second, second hand what you should be doing. This is the purpose of living for Christ is in while you're in the womb of your earth, you're developing into all that Christ in you means, including the level of glory that you'll uh, reflect for throughout eternity. Did I lose you in all that? Everybody's okay. Thumbs up. We're all good. All right. So uh, spiritually, we're supposed to mature while we're in this life. No matter what happens, that God is able to take all those things and cause them to become part of our maturation process. That's what it means, all things work together, for our maturation process. If we practice learning, 
if we're practicing something else, we're not maturing in godly ways, we're maturing in carnal ways. Right. How many of you think God wants us to mature in our carnality? No, no, we're, we're not supposed to mature in our carnality, mm -hmm. we're supposed to mature in our glory. Is what we're supposed to mature in, as sons of God. So this is kind of how maturation actually kind of happens. Let me take us back to thinking about children. Can I do that again? Because if you can see it here, it makes it less complicated when I talk about it over here. So here's how, here's how children come into life. You know, they don't know anything, right? And you bring them home, and you know basically everything. Relatively, you do, and they know nothing. So when uh, when they start growing up, you don't tell them everything you know. You tell them, and this is a, a word I like to use. So if, if if I've said it here before, just it's good for you to hear it again. But uh, you tell them as is age appropriate. Mm -hmm. Have I ever used that term up here before? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, now I'm using it. So let's, <laughs> so what I mean by that? Well, um, let's say they're turning two. And you think, well, it's it's time to learn to pick up your toys. And so age appropriate, we say it this way, it used to be a mystery to them. They didn't understand it. But now you reveal the mystery to them. So out of all you know, you say, here's the next level of something you didn't know that I'm going to teach you. Well, it's time to learn to pick up our toys. Right. So you instruct them. You go in the bedroom with them or a toy room or whatever and you get on on the floor and you make a game of it, right? Yeah, they look like ready to put it in. Uh -huh. Yeah, you do it here, you put it in. Yeah. And it's just, a, it's just a wonderful day. You teach the kids, right? To pick up their toys. And you go away just thinking you're the best mom because your child has helped pick up the toys. And you think that they have learned that lesson. Uh -huh. <laughs> Until the next day, you find the toys all over, and you say, Mom, I said pick up the toys, and it looks at you with this blank look, like I don't even know, I have no concept of what you're saying to me. We, I lived in yesterday, I don't think I did. I mean, you know, you know what children are like. And so you go again with them, and you instruct by walking alongside of them, and helping, and teaching, and training. And it, it goes like this, it goes, they listen, you help, they listen, they practice, they listen, they practice, they listen, they practice, they listen, they practice, because you get good at what you practice, mm -hmm. see. And they practice it until one day you can say, are your toys picked up? Yes, Mom, I, I did that before I went to bed. Okay, I'm going to come and check. And you come in, and they literally have learned to pick up their toys, and then you know you are the best mom in the world. <laughs> So another way I like to say it is what they hear, they have to be able to hear it. You, you've heard that. Don't just hear me, but hear me. You know, don't just see what I'm doing, but watch what I'm doing. Like get it. We want them to get it. So another way of saying that is they have incarnated their, their instruction. They have incarnated their word, the word. They have become what you were trying to teach them. And every time something new is taught to a child and they practice it until they get it and live it out, that's another step of maturation. Maturation is the incarnation of the information. It's just not, it's not just information giving. They have to learn to, live, to walk. So now they can walk out what they heard back there. And then, you know what? Uh, raising children is like it's one level after mystery to the next level and we we stay with them until they become what they've been taught isn't that what we're after till they become what they've heard you don't want them to come home and have done something stupid as a teenager and say to them did you never hear what and they go yeah i heard you but you didn't do it. How many of you think you don't feel it's quite as successful when they've heard it and have not done it? Or, or maybe for me personally, not, uh, not just what I've taught my children, but even for me, things that I think, why did I not do what I knew to do? Because the word was not yet incarnated. When the word is incarnated, you don't have to try. That's just who you are. That's maturation. And maturation is practicing until it's you. And then now you're there. Then you get new information and you practice and you practice until it's you and then you. So 
Jesus was the word incarnate. How many of you have heard that about him? Mm -hmm. Incarnate means in his carnal flesh, or in, not that he was carnal, the way you might think about it, just meant it was in his flesh. He was God's word walking, <coughs> always the full meaning of what God meant in everything he said and did because he was the word incarnate. Hello, maturation. The word incarnate. The releasing of the potential. The Christ in you. The level of glory increases. So much so that if somebody walks by you and needs something, they can just reach in and get some of that glory because it's your, you're the carrier of it. If somebody needs an answer, you don't have to say, well, let me go to the pastor and find out. You've matured at the day. I know the answer to that. I know the, uh, uh, the reality of that. I understand your, your situation. I think here's the word of, of God for you because you have matured. It isn't hard for adults to give answers to children because of the maturation level. Have you ever watched kids giving advice to each other? There's definitely a maturation level missing. But there isn't that same with parents and children because of the, the difference in the maturation. So we have to continue. Now, God has granted us the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, i got to go away. You know, his job was done, and he was going to the cross. And he said, but you're not quite grown up. This is uh, uh, John 14, John 16. I'm not going to have you look there. I'll just tell you this these passages, but he said, I'm going to go away, but you still have some things you don't know yet, you know, and fully mature, so I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit, and he will be with you, and he will be in you, and he will be your teacher, and he will be your tutor, so he's like the mom and dad, always in our ear, in our life, always saying, I'm, i got to tell you what you need to know now. Now, you don't need to know everything all at once. You only need to know the answer for what is right in front of you. For what, for, for the, 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 the journey that you're on, what do I need of in my maturation to know now? That's the Holy Spirit's job. He takes us from level to level. So he's in us, and he's going, i, I got something I, I need to tell you. Now, sometimes he, he tells us because we're bothering him. What's this? What's that? How come? Well, I don't understand that. You know, and we're, do you ever have the parents, as parents, your kids sometimes dog you about, but there's other times you know it's time for you to bring it up. Like I, I just said, my daughter went to her, my grandson and said, Dennis, I think maybe it might be time. I know you've longed for this, but I think it might be time. Do you think you're ready? And he said, yes, he was ready. And so she took the initiative. How many of you know 14-year-old Dennis didn't know how to contact anybody in Guatemala and who to ask and he didn't have he didn't have the adoption papers to even look up the mom's original name. He didn't have any of that. He just walked along with my daughter who started the process and he walked along and he's the beneficiary because he had a Holy Ghost guide in the form of his mother. That's who the Holy Spirit is to us. He knows. It's time for you to know this. It's time for you to have this answered. It's time for me to give you this mystery. And he also knows just because he's telling us something doesn't mean it's incarnated. So the next thing that happens is he gives us opportunities to practice. Everybody go, dun, dun, dun. Because <laughs> that's the hard part. Who doesn't love it when the revelation hits? Oh, I just saw. Right. But it's the practicing of it. It's the putting away your toys. It's getting on the bicycle and falling down and skinning your knee. It's practicing the word of God in the situations that have to be pushed back, have to be turned around, have to be altered, have to bring the power of heaven to sway against those things. It's the practicing of the revelation where we give up and go back to practicing what we've already known, which could be complaining, which could be whining, which could be manipulation. I mean, there's all sorts of ways that we handle our word worlds outside of mature word. Do you understand what I mean by that? Mm -hmm. And until we allow God to help us get honest with ourselves, I've seen, oh my gosh, we've pastored 40 years. I've been in the ministry 52 years. The saints are huge manipulators. Uh -huh. They want they want an answer. They want life easier. People in, 
in general do, but even in the house of God it's like this. And so manipulation go into throwing guilt on somebody else to fix the problems of our world. That, I mean, uh, uh, woe is me, feel sorry for me, give me a hand up, pray for me, you know, pray for yourself. I remember one time standing in the front of our church, uh, we were pastoring and this lady walked in, I need you to pray for my aunt and I need you to pray for, and she started giving me her prayer list and I said, you know what, I'm going to say no. What? I said, no, I'm going to say no. I said, because I've got my prayer list of my family that I'm praying for, and I'm taking responsibility to pray for my family. You take the responsibility and pray for your own family. Mm -hmm. Now, I knew her well, and I knew her pathway, and I had a relationship to be able to say that, or I would never right. be that, you know, uh, harsh. But, but as you won't grow up until you pray your own victory in. Mm -hmm. But when you get your own victory, you go, oh my gosh, even the demons were subject to it. I mean, you know, you're like, I did it. And it's it's the ownership of uh, uh, that causes you to say, now I'm grown up to this next level. Mm -hmm. And you're saved to grow up. There's Amen. Amen. heavy doctrine right today in the church. You're saved to grow up. You're born to grow up. You're born to become Christ. You're born to incarnate the word. You're born for sonship and maturation. That's what you're born for. To be able to uh, take the circumstances and discover. Here's what the Holy Ghost helps you do. Helps you look inside and discover something locked up in you that can be released. It's discover something hidden away, not yet developed, that you can tap into. Okay, the Holy Spirit says, here's a word of knowledge for you. And you go, oh, I never thought about doing that. Here's, here's a word of wisdom for you. I, I never thought about approaching it from that angle. And all of a sudden, you, he, he works along with you, and you become a problem solver. But it's the, it's the self solving of the problems that releases the maturation. I'd like to say to you, you could take three vitamins and be there tomorrow. <laughs> it just isn't the way it works. It's taking ownership of your world. Now, that isn't to say that there aren't times we need help. You know, like your pastor right now, he needs to be surrounded by them yeah. and and you've done that and that that's absolutely wonderful and there's time where it takes two to put a thousand to flight so there's there's room for all that but if our practice is not taking our worlds me and Jesus and help if that's not our practice but it's rolling it off to somebody else you'll stay a baby forever uh -huh. if the children uh, if their parents do not make them responsible they'll never mature and they'll stay a baby forever and grown-ups that are babies inside are are uh, it's hard to see that because they don't have the confidence that they really are who Christ has called them to be and God doesn't want any um, he doesn't want any superman superheroes wonder womans and all the rest of us just needing them to do for us. He wants to make us all mature sons and daughters. So that's what the scripture says, you're changed, uh, Romans 12, you're changed, that's the metamorphosis that happens by the renewing of your mind. But it, listen again, it isn't just what you know, it's what you've incarnated. So by the renewing of your mind, that's the first part is you have to hear something different. You have to have a mystery revealed. You have to hear it. But then you have to practice it because you get good at what you practice. Or another thing is you incarnate, you become what you practice. So the renewing of your mind is not just uh, hearing something new, but it's the hearing it and the practicing of it until there is a metamorphosis. Romans 12, that's the word that's used. It's the idea of a caterpillar uh, coming out of its cocoon and turning into a butterfly. That's the exact same he Greek word used in that Romans 12 passage. We are, come on, putting off the carnal casings, are we not, to spread our, our uh, Christ in us and show the glory of this new creation that he's made us to be. So with that in mind, I, I just want to close with... Um, um, I won't go to the Philippians passage other than to say this is Paul saying he was pressing toward that. <laughs> Kept on moving toward that goal. Didn't think he'd attained it all, but moving toward that goal. 
But there's an amazing story, and you're going to know this well. It's found in um, the Gospel of John, chapter 11. Well, I won't read the whole of it. Most of it I'll be able to tell quickly because you know the story. <clears throat> but this is, uh, this is the story of Lazarus when he died. And so do you remember that Mary and Martha were his sisters? And uh, Lazarus gets very sick, and Jesus isn't there, so they call for him to come. But there's, there's like some stages of development that I saw when I was reading this uh, story that I just kind of wanted to point out to you. So it begins uh, in chapter 11, verse 1. I'll, I'll read a few verses and then tell the story to move us a little more quickly. But Now there was a certain man who was sick named Lazarus of Bethany. Uh, the town of Mary and his sister Martha. Um, so that's how this story begins, but it's not the first time in the Bible you meet these three. So the, the, this is, was a, a stopover house for Jesus. Where he, when he was in the area, he was their honored guest. Remember the story of Mary sitting around listening and Martha's up working and Martha wants to help. Mary to get her to help because because when Jesus came they filled the house and there was a lot of food you know a lot of care so they they treated him as an honored guest and they served him and, and they opened the doors for him to come and uh, how many of you ever opened your home for hospitality over these years we've had oh I I'd be hard pressed to guess how many uh, pastors and uh, apostles and prophets have been in our house because we pastored so we invited them and if they would stay in the house we brought them into the house and served them at our dining room table well I went into overdrive before the, they got there I mean it's one thing to have the sheets clean but you want to make the corners of the room clean and, and you want to have food bought and halfway prepped and set a pretty table and so that he that's how they uh, at the beginning would have known him as an honored guest and they interacted with him and he received their hospitality and apparently they believed he was a teacher too <clears throat> qualified teacher because Mary sat at his feet and Jesus said that's that's that was a right choice on her to be able to receive the truth. So before we know anything about this story, we know already that there is a measure of relationship that they've had with him. Or we could say in the whole journey of walking with Jesus, they've made a couple of steps. But when, by the time we meet him here, they've made a couple of steps of knowing him. Now, he's his... Uh, the brother is sick, so they call on Jesus. So that's going to tell you something else. That means they also know him as the healer. So probably when he was at the house, not only is he preaching, but he always had this tendency to just heal everybody in the room. Right? <laughs> so they have watched him, and apparently that truth is real to them. That he's also he's not only the honored guest, he's not only a teacher, he's also a healer. <coughs> so they send for him, and I, I love verse three. It says, "Therefore his sister sent for him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick." And, and, and that phrase, "He whom thou lovest," that means they know there's also a, a, a real strong bond. He's not just a stranger that stopped by. They have developed a relationship, and they're confident in his heart toward them. So can you see, like, advancement in the revelation? Because not everybody would have known Jesus. They maybe heard he was somebody out there in the wilderness healing. They would have gone out to get that from him to for, for whatever he had to give. But these guys know him on a, on a whole different level. So there's uh, the honored guest, the teacher, the healer, the relationship. So they begin to call for call and send a message for him to come. You know the story. He decides to wait a couple of days instead of coming right then. And he waits long enough, and he knows now that Lazarus has passed from the, from the illness. Okay, here, here's one of these things that you get to practice. You know, you get, you get to practice hard. Hello, hard times come. Circumstances come. Now we have the benefit of knowing. Let me say this at this point. We have the benefit of knowing that God had a good plan. They don't know that yet. But so they're on the road with what they know, but they don't know enough yet. Okay, do you know the story? They don't know enough yet. You don't know enough yet. I don't know enough yet. The Holy Spirit's my teacher. He keeps setting me into circumstances so that I can know him more. But I have to practice and live in those circumstances and take the responsibility of those circumstances and seek the Lord in those circumstances. Or I'm practicing 
in this, I'm practicing fear. I'm practicing anxiety. I'm practicing desperation. How many of you know there's so many emotions and so much knowledge that we can practice? There are, I've seen people grow older into their senior years that all, when they open their mouth, you can just tell that bitterness is yeah. tightly woven into their heart. You know how they got there? Practice. Practice, Practice makes perfect. I've, I've seen seniors who just, uh, they stand, and, and I've actually said this to my husband, I said, honey, when we're meeting with seniors, if the conversation goes into the levels of sickness, I said, I just want you to know I'm walking away. And you can say goodbye and walk away with me, or you can stand and talk with them, but I wouldn't suggest you stand and talk with them because you get good at what you practice. So is this what we're going to practice together as seniors? We're going to talk about all our aches and pains. And I'm, I'm, not, going to I'm, I'm not going to practice that. Because I believe I get good at what I practice. Uh -huh. And so, so Mary and Martha, they're, they're home with their brother who dies, and Jesus doesn't come yet until eventually, you know the story, he says to his uh, disciples, it's time to go now. And, um, and I love in verse 11, it says, uh, um, he, and then, shoot, maybe I need to, he's, he's been talking to him about walking in the light. And then it goes in verse 11, these things said he, what we're not, I haven't preached to you what he said, but he was given a, a little mini sermon. So where we're picking up, he just finished that little mini sermon. And then he says, and after that, he said unto them, our friend Lazarus sleeps. Now, we heard Mary say, Jesus whom thou loves. But now we hear Jesus say, our friend. And this concept of friendship means he's a disciple. Remember Jesus said, you're, you're no, I'm not going to... Uh, I'm not going to call you servants anymore. I'm going to call you friends. So th this this is the word Jesus puts out. Lazarus is is a, a part of his discipleship team, part of the people that he reveals mysteries to. So he said, our friend Lazarus sleeps, is asleep, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. And then, of course, they're going, well, if he's asleep, he's probably getting better. And Jesus had to clear it up. No, no, he's, he's like not sleeping as in snoozing. He's sleeping as in dead. All right, so now they, they go down. And as they come down, um, Martha run, is the first one to run out to meet him when she hears that the master is there. And verse 20 says, 22 uh, but I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it to thee. Now that phrase is faith, but it's, it's faith in the fact that she knows he's a prophet. Uh, that's what they believed about the prophets in Israel. They, they believed that the prophets heard and then God did with the mouth of the prophets. So she's now acknowledging, kind of hear this with me. He's, he's an honored guest. He's a teacher. We have a relationship. We love him. He loves us. He's a healer. So, so we can see that this this ain't her first rodeo, but it ain't her last one either, right? <laughs> and and so she's maturing here, and so she's now she's calling on him as a prophet, uh, which again makes you understand that there was a level of revelation functioning in her. She she was able to function in that. And then, uh, oh, I'm just going to read a few verses here and talk about them. Verse 23, Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. And Martha says to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Now, here's what she's doing. She's spitting out her head knowledge. That's her doctrine. And that was right doctrine. But listen, I don't want you to hear me say pick up the toys. I want you to incarnate the reality of being a toy picker up her. <laughs> So, so this is a revelation of he wants to bring her from head knowledge to incarnated truth. He wants to bring her from what she uh, only has information about to where this is her present possession. Because that's how maturation happens. So he, she says, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection of the last day. And Jesus said, right here, right here, right now, I am. Not out there someday, right here, right now. You know me in all these other ways. Honey, I brought you to the place to know me here today. 
Maturation means the Holy Spirit is bringing us into further and continuing revelation of who our Christ is and what he's done for us. And we don't know it all yet. And circumstances arise where we can practice and meet him in a new level or we can re re return back to what we've always practiced. And we will not hit that next level of maturation. So she said, he says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. And then he says, uh, if, if any man believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. So he's bringing that home. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. So he says, can, can you believe I'm here right now for life? That's what he's saying, can you believe? And so she doesn't really answer that question. Here's what she says. Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of, the God, a Son of God, which should come into the world. This is a huge revelation that she's got. She's saying, you're the, you're the expected Messiah. Remember when Jesus was with his disciples, Matthew 16, and, and uh, that's the passage where he, said, where he says, I'm going to build my church, that passage. But anyway, before he says that, he says to them, who, who are people saying that I am? And they come up with various answers, and Peter goes, you're the Christ. And Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed that to you, but my Father which is in heaven. So Jesus said to Peter, bingo. That's what he said, bingo. That's what he's saying here to her too, bingo. That t t totally right on. So he's bringing revelation and she's receiving revelation. Now she doesn't have the revelation yet because she sees her brother dead. So she doesn't really have the revelation of resurrection now. She got the rev That's down the road, but she has such an incredible revelation of who she is. To, to get to the place of believing for resurrection this would seem to indicate to us that she's taken a few steps in maturation, right? And this is what this passage is proving. So she says, You're, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And so he's challenged her to believe now that he is the resurrection right there present. So as you go on and read the story, Mary now comes out. And there's a discussion between Mary and Martha and Jesus. And then uh, Jesus goes to the grave. And you remember this story. He says to them, take away the stone. And um, um, verse 40, verse 39, he says, take away the stone. And then verse 40, he said, said I not unto you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God. He's bringing that around. He's tying those two parts. I said to believe, not believe with me here. And as you believe, you will see released potential. That's what I mean. When you'll see the glory of God, you'll see the potential of who I am and what the word is and what I can do. So then they took the stone away. He's keeping her believing, keeping her present, keeping her learning, keeping her practicing. Believe. Practice this, Mary. Practice this, Martha. Practice this. Believe this. Let this run around. Believe I am the resurrection. Believe I am the Son of God. Believe I am present. Believe. Can you believe that? Can you keep? What are you putting? What are you running through your mind while you're waiting? What are, what are you practicing in your brain while you're waiting for the manifestation of the glory of God? And then, then he says, Father, I thank you that you heard me. And I, I know you always hear me, but because of the people that stand by, I say it, that they might believe. And then verse 43, 43 he said, Lazarus, come forth. Shut up. <laughs> I mean, it's hard to even imagine that the spirit body, you know, when we pass from this life, we leave, we leave our flesh behind, but we're a man on the inside. We have a spirit man. That's the sum total of essence of who we are, except for the suit that we're... Like we move out of this house, but the, if you ever move out of a house, you're still you and all your stuff is you. You're just not in that house anymore. So all that Lazarus was was present, and Jesus called that spirit man back into his body with such a dynamic. Yeah, I mean, to be dead that many days and then thinking that he stinks by now means that there's just rot. So whatever was rotted, every blood vessel uh, just coagulated and every, every tissue, every cell rot in the state of rot, his brain in the state of rot, his body in the state of rot, whatever killed him to begin with, <laughs> you know, 
all, all of that. And there was such release of power from the eternal realm into this impossible situation that that body, that body suit, it totally came alive with heaven's power and he walks out of the tomb. And, and here, Mary and Martha going, oh, oh. you'll never, listen, they'll, they never could have that taken away from them. From that point forward, they, it didn't matter what anybody said, nobody was going to take that reality. It had been ingrained in them. It had been incarnated in them. They knew Jesus in a way now that they had never known him, except that that circumstance. They walked with him through it and into a new day, and now they are new people because of what they have experienced in Christ. This is our pathway. It, our, our journey may be different individually, but the pathway is the same for all of us. We go from glory to glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of God. We go from maturation to maturation as we incarnate the Word. We are transformed into His image. That we're born to grow up, but you grow up and become what you practice. Can you hear what I'm saying to you? So the question is, what you practicing? And sometimes we need somebody to be our mirror for us. You need to empower somebody to say, tell me what I'm saying with my mouth in case I'm not hearing what I'm saying. And then instead of, you know, getting mad because somebody shined the mirror in you, I say, thank you, now I can see what I need to stop practicing so I know what I can practice. And from that day with Artie till now, I'm saying, how we practice in our courage. And they brought up a little uh, a warrior figurine. I said, look at that, Artie. He's got courage. You got courage. You don't have to be afraid. What are we practicing? I just, uh, I just felt like I wanted to stop by today and say, you know, this church, you've had a lot to overcome. So the question is, what's ahead? You are at the level of your prophecies. You are to become what you've been ordained to be. You endure, and God works that endurance and that stuff together so you can be what it is he's made you to be. You, you, you start out a baby. Even if, you're the, even if you're a pastor, you still... Everybody starts out the same way, and a pastor just means a called person. Doesn't necessarily mean they got all their ducks in a row. And I speak that not from your pastor's experience, but from mine. Dennis and I pastored 40 years. I'd like to tell you, we grew a bunch in understanding not just how to pastor, but how to be God's people. That everybody grows in whatever circumstances that you're in. So you can either look at your circumstance and say, this is a chance for me to get a new revelation and practice that new revelation until this circumstances yields a new level of glory. Yeah. Or, woe is me, why did this happen to me? And here, here I'm saying this because there is no condemnation. Sometimes you get hit with something and you have to catch your, you have to catch your breath. Or you lose something and you have to go through a window of grief. So I'm not taking any of that away from you. But once, you, once you're stabilized, then start practicing something new. Right? And uh, how long do you practice it? I mean, there were some things I thought my kids would never get. For example, the boys just tended to want to hit each other and shove each other. And I would say... I, want, I would make them sit there and say kind words to each other after it was over. You say and you say kind words. Oh, you got a good muscle. You know, I mean, <laughs> okay, well, we can go a little deeper, but we'll start with that. But I can remember when they, I, my boys are best friends with each other. My girls are too. And they've got each other's back. There was a lot of days they wouldn't have had each other's back. As a matter of fact, I'd be a little afraid to leave them home alone in case they'd get each other in the back or something, you know. But they they matured into being. Hear what I'm saying? So how many years did it take them to grow out of that teenage, uh, I'm going to beat up on anything I want to because I'm a man? 
you know, how I took a lot of years for compassion and understanding and long suffering to develop. It took took a lot of years. God is long suffering with us as we're developing. We get down on ourselves more quickly than God gets down on us. But the Holy Spirit is walking with us side by side that we can transform our worlds. And as our worlds are transformed, we're transformed. I'm going to say it again from glory to glory to glory. You become what you practice. practice. You become what you practice. Let's pray. Lord, I release grace for myself. I release grace for uh, Pastor Brian. I release grace for broken chains. And I release grace for every person sitting here today. That we may, by your spirit, Lord, and by your Holy Ghost help, walk with you through the ups and downs of life, through the process of knowing and learning and practicing and becoming. Until, Lord, uh, you can say of each of us and you can say of this house that we are uh, a city set on a hill, that we are a testimony of the incarnated word. I just release grace, Lord. Grace and patience, grace and endurance, grace and faith uh, for all of our lives and for this house. In Jesus' name.